Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who are wondering why Julie Cortins, our advertised host, looks a little bit different today, uh, I'm afraid Julie is unwell and has had to withdraw from today's session. Uh, I'm sure you'll join me in wishing Julie a speedy recovery. Um, and meanwhile, I'm pleased to say she has entrusted me to the host seat for today. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Sharp. I'm the CEO of an organization called International Workplace. And I've been involved in the IWFM Awards for a number of years. And uh, this last year, just gone, I was the lead judge for the collaboration category. So welcome to episode 25 in IWFM's Navigating Turbulent Times series. For the last six months, we've been exploring uh, the impact of today's challenges on workplace and facilities management, including, of course, the impact of COVID-19. We've called this episode First Class Responders, Lessons from Award-Winning Case Studies. Now, two weeks ago, we celebrated the 20th edition of the IWFM Awards virtually, and I hope you're able to join us for that. It was a great occasion. We couldn't have, uh, we couldn't have the usual celebration, but um, what was lacking in sparkle and glitter was more than made up for in the quality of stories that came through in this, the strangest of years, and that was in both the COVID and the non-COVID categories. In this, it's this uh, deeper aspect of our awards that we wanted to explore in today's webinar. So I'm delighted today to be joined by three special guests who we'll meet in a moment. Uh, we each operate in different parts of our sector, and between us, we've got a wide range of experience. To give us some context, we would usually have a kind, uh, some kind of reflection after each edition of the awards when the judges get together to discuss them. But I think this year has been such an interesting one, perhaps even a pivotal one uh, for Workplace and FM that we thought it would be interesting to have some of those reflections as more of an open conversation, hence the webinar. One that will encompass the panel's wider thoughts and also some of the learning from this experience for us to take forward into the future. So as we progress, please do post your thoughts and questions into the questions box on the platform and we'll do our best to answer as many of those as we can, either as we go along or at the end. So without further ado, let's introduce our panel. Um, I'm going to ask them just to say who they are and to tell us which single story resonated with them most from among all the amazing entries this year and in which categories and, and why. So let's start with uh, Joanna, why don't you go first? Hello, thank you, David. And hello, Vic and Ross. Um, I'm a cons management consultant operating in the FM and workplace arena. Um, I've worked in this industry for a long time, both as a, an in-house FM and as a service provider. Um, my background includes being one of the founders of the Stoddart Review and being a judge on these awards for quite a number of years. I know the guy that created them is David Hogg, and it was created by the members for the industry to highlight best in class and share good practice, which is great. Um, this year, I worked alongside Ross and Julie in a, in a mentor role, um, helping wherever necessary. And eventually I took over the technology award as the lead judge on that. Um, you know, these awards have developed and progressed over a number of years, and we've had amazing chairs of judges, including Oliver Jones and Steve Gladwin, and now Julie. And Julie's made the big change into the impact awards. And it was Julie that actually created the idea around the COVID special awards, which is great. And that's really amazing. And my, I, I'm not gonna pick on one entry, but I'm going to talk about the overall impact, which is all about how people have reacted to COVID, they have actually picked up the infection control, collaboration, and actually doing it for each other. It's about that whole piece, just getting on with it, but, which I hope is enough of an introduction, David. Yeah, no, absolutely, no worries. So um, how about you next, Ross? Thanks, David. Um, good morning, everyone, or is it afternoon, actually? Um, so Ross yep. Abate, I'm the CEO of MACE Operate, um, the FM arm of the MACE Group. Um, I've been judging I think not as long as Julie but, uh, and Joanna, but I'm um, close to 10 years now. 
Um, and with her, we worked as being the mentor and supporting judges. Um, for my sins, I ended up being a judge in social value and actually um, towards the end, I actually became the lead judge on the day and on the final thing. So it's very interesting to be involved in that. My, my thing about, um, you know, the thing that I noticed, and it's very similar to what Joanna said, it was the spirit of FM, you know, the spirit of the people in, in, in the industry and, you know, how we all work together to get things done. And I think, yeah. um, and Vic, was, we were talking about it yesterday, it was, it's about how people have all got involved and it didn't matter which organisation you work for, it didn't matter what service you're doing, everyone just mucked in and, 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 and got, to, got together to get, get, get services done. The other thing I, I found, and it was in, in my category also, is we've got a really bright future. There are so many people coming through um, that actually are not just about FM, it's about this whole social value that they bring, that the FM industry brings. Yeah. And you can see um, bright minds that are, you know, that are coming through at the moment. And I think our future is so strong going forward. So that's probably my takeaway from the awards this year. Excellent, thanks Ross. And Vic, how about you? Yes, thank you, David, and hello, the rest of us. Um, so, I get I mean, an introduction to me. I am the managing director of Motivational Voice. I'm a personality profiler and behavioural specialist. I study people, and let's face it, that is the heart of FM, isn't it? It's all about the people. So, um, to me, I'm looking here on the notes that I made, and it was again. I don't want to pick out anything or any one entry specifically but what I saw this year now I've been judging for seven eight years now I became the lead judge of social value but as Ross has just said there due to a love a last minute conflict of interest I had to step away and, and Ross stepped up so thank you for that Ross um, but it was the it was the differences in organizations when I first started it was very much the larger organizations but I've definitely seen over the last few years about actually the small businesses entering and the small businesses winning as well. So it's it's not about these aren't awards for large corporates. These are awards for anyone in facilities management and the, the COVID-19 awards. I mean, wow, I, I mean, we'll talk about those. I know in a little bit, but they really did. They really I think I think we cried, didn't we, David? But we'll talk about that in a bit. We Thank did you. do, yes, yes. I mean, one of the one of the things that we we said, you know, it's, it's very difficult to highlight just one, um, and arguably not very fair to highlight just one. And one of the uh, one of the entrants to the COVID awards, one of the rules when you enter the IWFM awards, um, if you if you're normally so in other years, if you're not shortlisted, we never discuss. Um, you, you wouldn't know, so we never discuss people who entered. They get feedback, so everybody gets feedback if they request it, but we never discuss people who weren't shortlisted. And in the case of the COVID award, I mean, the one that I would highlight wasn't shortlisted, and I think it's a, an exceptional year, and I'm sure we can break a rule to do it, but it was from, um, it was a guy called Ed, Edmund Yeo from the Chinese Information Culture Center, I think. And, and I mean, it's, I, I don't know if you're watching Edmund, maybe, maybe not, but he's a terrific um, entry of, uh, and a, a whirlwind guy who's both the chairman and a volunteer, and they're doing such great work in Chinatown um, normally, you know, and when COVID came along, they threw themselves into it. And in that particular entry, there was there was video of them at the fire brigade. I mean, it was, it was he was popping up everywhere. And the, there was that sense that Ross referred to as well. And you you too, Joanna, about that, that sense of everybody just being, you know, mucking in and, and making things happen. So, yeah, we'll come on to some of those. But that was the one that stuck out for me. And it didn't even make any of our any of the shortlists in the end to actually uh, make it to the public vote. So um, we don't have time to go through all of the 15 uh, winners this time, but um, I would encourage everybody, please do read uh, their inspiring case studies on the IFM mm. awards website. All of the uh, information is there. Um, so um, with regard to, to us here in the panel, let's spend some time reflecting on the, the COVID award itself and how it's impacted on our uh, a profession and how it's been perceived. And um, once it was clear that Vic mentioned there, there were 69 entries for this award, which took everybody by surprise, I think. It's a terrific response. Um, once it was clear there were so many, the aim of just having one winner just seemed to be just, just plain, you know, plainly unfair. And uh, we wanted to try and find a way of, um, of celebrating more widely. So um, I know, as as Joanna said, Julie was instrumental here. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and um, we decided to split them into four different categories. And those categories were keeping good work going, 
supporting the community on the COVID front line and adapting to new realities. So maybe Vic, if I could start with you, because you and I were involved in, in um, dividing those 69 entries into four groupings. Um, what were you seeing that you don't normally see at the IWFM awards? Oh, thank you, David. And um, yeah, I guess firstly, actually watching all 69 of those, uh, like I said, it was, it, I felt really humbled, not just being a judge on the awards, but actually as part of that, those, uh, the COVID awards as well. But to me, it was the rawness of the entries. Now, I, you know, we, they weren't slick. We had people taking videos on their iPhones. We really showed how FM is on the front line, no matter what industry you're in, FM is there, it's an integral part, it's like the glue, if you like, of, of business. No matter what your industry is, FM is in it. And those awards just showed how much people cared, that they didn't, they, it was rolling up your sleeves and just mucking in because FM is, is a people industry. And that mm. is what those awards, that, that specific category, the COVID-19 really showed me is how much FM cares about the people that they work with. I, I know Julie uh, said it. Julie uh, said it. People questioning. questioning. She had people questioning whether um, they should enter because of the they didn't have the slick professional video making skills. And I, I know she said just enter, just enter, whatever you do, just enter. And it is the, I think it's the unvarnished uh, appearance, and it's the fact that you've got people walking around with a mobile phone. Um, just it just shows you that that it can be done and actually some of these entries were and arguably better than some of the really professionally made ones weren't they <laughs> um, where people, yes. people just went and spoke to people they spoke to their customers they spoke to their suppliers um, and it, it, you got that real sense of togetherness from the whole thing um, so Joanna maybe asking you then what, what do you think this is the first time in my knowledge that IWFM have had a public vote and obviously for this particular category what, what difference do you think that made? No, oh, a great difference, huge, because it involved the whole, not just our FM and workplace community, but it involved the clients and their clients and their customers and their community. So everybody had the opportunity to, to cast a vote. And I think we had thousands of votes in the end, which just blew my mind that so many people were concerned and interested. Maybe this is part of the turning point for people understanding what FM is all about. You know, when we created the Stoddart Review, it was to, it, to engage with the C-suite and get them involved. But actually, these awards have created that platform right across the organisations. I'm thrilled. I think it's just been exceptional. And again, just to, I think just as there were so many entries, there were so many votes, weren't there? I mean, in their thousands. Yes. Um, which was, I, I, I thought from that as well, it was a, um, it was an opportunity for for supply for, for clients, you know, entrants to get their suppliers involved and to get a bit of a bandwagon going as well. Yeah. And I think I've made, probably made the point before. I mean, I personally, I, I mean, I don't have any say in this, obviously. And you know, I'm, I'm already an imposter in Julie's shoes, but I'm hoping that we that next year that some element of public voting could be carried forward. And if I get told off for, for saying that, then fine. But um, it, it it kind of gives. Um, a legitimacy and a bandwagon feel to it, I think. I think the point I made before was that when, normally with an award, when you enter it, it stops at the point that you enter it. You kind of enter it and wait to see what happens. Whereas with a public vote, you enter it, and that's just the start of the process, isn't it? Because then it all, it begins to kind of bubble. And um, you often see, we all know, you know, FM gets, gets um, you know, accused of being undervalued. And I thought this was a good way of keeping the conversation going and the buzz going. So. Yeah, personally, I thought it was a fantastic thing to do and, and it, you know, all organised in a really short time scale too. So hats off. And I do know also how much uh, work was involved in the background with IWFM because this was an as well as, not, a, not an instead of, wasn't it? Um, so let's have a look. Should we start looking at the winners then? Um, the, um, the first one to look at, I think, is um, Lloyd, Lloyd's Banking Group and Mighty. Um, which was a, a category that I was also involved in. The winner seems to sum up um, the stories we saw about maintaining productive and connected work environments and doing it safely and mindfully while so many of us are working remotely and in 
diverse circumstances. So there was a lot of moving parts here with the um, Lloyds Banking Group and Mighty Entry. Should we take a look at that film? I think we're going to run the video. Across our estate, the Lloyds Banking Group helps 30 million customers manage their finances. When the COVID-19 pandemic broke, it was vital we remained open for business. Our facilities management team and partner Mighty work quickly and closely to establish a joint strategic model that set out how we would keep our business running in a COVID-19 safe and compliant way. We made and executed decisions at pace under huge pressure with massive commitments across our joint team. I have been a part of a team delivering a lot of extra cleaning, where we have increased the frequency of clean. Our colleagues really appreciate this. We've supported social distancing in over 1800 Lloyds Bank and Group premises. We've moved furniture in our offices and branches to ensure social distancing can take place. And we've clearly labelled desks that are safe to use. We've installed guides and markers so our customers and colleagues can move safely through our offices and branches. And we regularly pulse check our offices and branches to ensure the environment remains COVID safe. It's important to keep colleagues feeling safe while in the workplace. I patrol regularly and talk to colleagues to make sure they have access to hand sanitizers and are following social distancing measures. In the early days of the pandemic, we had to work really hard to secure PPE. Our colleagues really appreciate having plenty of PPE on site. In March this year, around 50,000 Lloyds Banking Group employees were suddenly forced to work at home with only a laptop. Within a week, Mighty had mobilised the Office at Home programme, which enabled staff to order chairs and monitors to their homes so they could work more comfortably. Mighty engineers volunteered to be delivery drivers, and by the end of July, we had collected more than 28,000 items from offices and delivered to colleagues' homes, and we continue to do this. Within my role at Lloyds Banking Group, it's meant I've had to come into the office rather than work from home. At first, I was worried about the risk. However, with the social distancing and in-depth cleaning, I'm really reassured. This is a new normal and I'm comfortable and I'm happy to be at work. What we've seen is a strong partnership between our two organisations with incredible commitment to get the job done and keep us open for business. I'm very proud of everyone who has worked so hard to make this happen and we know our colleagues and customers appreciate it too. We can see clapping, but not hear clapping. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that was great, wasn't it? And it was one of many, a very deserving winner, but one, one of many terrific entries. Um, collaboration was such an important part to that. And um, while um, it, uh, Lloyd's Banking Group and Mighty are, are the entrants there, there were six other organisations that were involved in that, including Affiona, I saw, and Arcadis as well. And uh, so maybe if I could come to you, Ross, and just ask in terms of the, the collaborative approach, what do you think made that one stood out and where do you think kind of collaboration has played its part here? I think in, in all collaboration is about making sure you're both working together. It's the behaviours you, you have in the relationship. There's no, you know, so, you know, in, in that you could see that the relationships were, they both out for the same win-win outcomes. And, and that's really important in any collaboration deal. You can't have this master-servant agreement. You've got to have this win-win outcome with positive intent to deliver on what you want to achieve. And I think that is the key to any of them. And also, you know, you need to have the right mentality. You can see that they're working together to, to achieve the outcomes that they did. Yeah, you can. Joanna, thoughts on that one? What made it such a good winner? It, it reminded me of um, my time with the Clipper Race. In, you're on a 70-foot yacht, and there are 17 of you on that yacht. You're all pulling in the same direction. This is what Lloyds Bank and Mighty have done. They have actually realised they're in their yacht, however many sub-yachts they've got, and they all pull together for the sake of each other, for the sake of the business, for continuity, to drive away those fearful um, aspects of CV19 and just to get on with it because life has to go on we have to get on with it all fabulous I, stuff I, 
I, I think, Joanna, the point that that everyone's got their role to play and everyone yes. played their role is the important yes. thing, if you take your analogy. And I think yeah. in, in all collaborative matters, if you don't want people checking the checker or whatever. You want people to say, this, this is my role. We're all in it side by side and we're delivering together. Absolutely. Fabulous. I, I think that was reflected in the, um, I, I think I mentioned at the outset, having been the lead judge for the collaboration category this year, we had, when I mean, our shortlist of five was, was one of the best short, shortlists I've seen in my years as a judge. And it was won by Sodexo and Johnson & Johnson, which was a real partnership. And we had entrants there from uh, HMPPS and Amy and from, um, Ed, uh, from um, uh, Eddington uh, and from um, Direct Line Group and from uh, the Hubs Network guys, the Matrix Hubs. And all in all of those cases, I mean, our winner was um, the, the weaker Sodexo, Johnson Johnson, was really, it was more than just a one team approach. It was about shared goals. It was about everybody understanding what their role was. Um, and and you know, it was planned, it wasn't accidental. And I think that's what's in, the, in this Lloyd's Mighty one. You can see that in a very compressed time scale, the amount of planning has gone on to make it, you know, to, to make it happen. Um, it is it, just everybody pulling together is the kind of, that's, that's what COVID-19 response has been about, hasn't it? Mm. Really impressive. So we move on and look at the next one. The next one was um, the community, so supporting the community. And this was won by Edmonton Green Shopping Centre, uh, Ashdown Phillips and Partners. So let's take a look at their video. time in fairness but even more so during the, the COVID period. Without you and what you've delivered over this time period there's no doubt Edmonton Green wouldn't be in the position that it is today. The one I think was most important to me is when when two of you actually went and bought some food parcels and delivered to vulnerable residents that we have on our site and for that my hat's off. So I won't dwell on it anymore but thank you very much for everything that you've done. You're a credit to Edmonton Green and you're a credit to yourself. Edmonton Green means to me that on a Monday to Friday I come into work and I'm not just going into the office, I'm coming to work in the community with a great security, cleaning, management, extended community team that all work together to make Edmonton Green a better place. So I'm going to uh, put you on the spot, <clears throat> Ross, slightly, if that's okay, to um, 
just to because you were involved in the social value award uh, as lead judge i think were you uh, at the end just to see where you would put that particular entry in the main awards i mean that i'm i'm assuming that would have been kind of worthy of an entry into the main award no no absolutely of, of course it is i mean social value is a really tough thing because it's all about the good you put back into the community and you can see the value that this has created due, due to covid and stuff like that so yeah I, it, we probably would have rated with you know i shouldn't say this but probably within the top three easily and then it would have been really hard to judge how you go from there yeah and what do you think um john what do you think's in it for 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 the people who have entered here why do you think they entered that particular um submission i just think it highlights how the community can pull together it's their commitment it's how they collaborate it's the the understanding of a single focus of getting things done for the community it actually focuses on the fact that there are no prima donnas everybody's in it together and i just love that it is just so good it's about humanity and actually isn't that what fm is about humanity human serving humans serving humans do you, uh, do you know what I particularly liked about FM was the fact that there were, um, th instead of it just being a defensive, um, you know, this has happened, therefore we must do this. And it wasn't only in this in this entry either, it was in many of the other ones too. It was people who'd seen an opportunity to do something different. So they didn't just say, this happened and therefore we did that. It was like, with the, the guy there saying, you know, it's an opportunity to bring people off the street and to, and to get people involved, to train people, to do stuff that we hadn't thought of doing or, hadn't done or you know it was too difficult to do or there's always good reasons not to do it so I for, for me part of that you, you know you would feel very proud walking around Edmonton Green Shopping Centre funny enough my wife was was born just near there I showed her that entry originally and she said that's got to be the winner and I, <laughs> I said well look, you vote yourself you know but um you would if you were there if you worked there you get this real sense of pride don't you you really do yeah um, so Vic, as far as um, the social value, when you were involved in it before you moved away from that, what's been your experience of social value in the environments that you've worked in? Um, obviously, bearing in mind the, the, the new laws come in recently with regard to procurement social value, hasn't it? So what's, yeah, the, what's been well, your experience? I guess, I mean, and I know Julie was instrumental when the first social value category came about um, was a couple of years ago. And I think being part of it and actually seeing how many organizations do give back. And, and I think most human beings, we want to give back. And that is the part of, actually that's, is that not really kind of the, the, the backbone of FM is the fact that we are always, I mean, as Joanna just said there, humans serving humans, but we just, we're givers. FMs are givers. And I think the, the organizations that I've seen enter the awards for social value, they don't do it with um, not so much the entry award, but they they don't give back with like bells and whistles on. They don't go and shout about look at the great thing that I'm doing and giving back. They do it because they want to. They do it because it's part of their DNA. And you know, I'm I'm a great believer in volunteering is giving back. You know, I mean, we're all volunteers. We're all judges of the award. We've all been volunteers in different you know, sectors and regions and, and specialist interest groups within the IWFM, because part of our DNA is giving back. And in fact, watching that one there, I started getting goosebumps again. I was just like, just remind me of watching all 69 of them. It was just fundamental. I think the more we, we give back, I'm just looking at any notes I've put on there, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's a people industry and we support our people. That, that's what we do. I, I, um, I totally agree, and I think one of the things that's come from this COVID response award this year is there are there are good re. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people um, who are quite rightly cynical in this world, and we are all busy. We're running businesses, organisations. Um, I often get asked, "Why bother entering awards? What's the point?" And um, we enter our company enters awards as well, and there are there are some good reasons why you should enter them. For me, one of them is there's clearly people want to do it to promote themselves. They want to be seen to be good at what they do, and there's no harm in that. The reason we've entered in the past is to benchmark ourselves because we want to see are we any good? Are we on the right track? How do we stack up against other people? Actually, putting yourself through this process is a really good way. I mean, that's why I'm a big advocate of awards. Um, I David, think. I think, also, I think also people do it to say thank you to the teams 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, you, know, it, you know, if you put it to the side, I mean, I know when we enter awards, it's almost to say, thank you. You've done a great job. You need the recognition and that's why we're putting you forward. And I think mm -hmm. these awards reflect that, you know, there's a lot of unsung heroes out there that we don't know about. And I think what Vicky's saying is so so true. You know, there's so many people that we just don't know about that do a fantastic job day in, day out in our industry. And this is a way to get them recognized and bring them to the fore. Yeah. I totally agree again, Ross. I think that that's the um, you stole my nice third point there. I'm, I'm not going to bother writing bullet points again. But the, <laughs> what what I do think is different this year is where you might have said thank you in the past. Those people probably wouldn't be in that room in the Grosvenor House, would they, with their with their you know cocktail dress or black tie on, because they, they, they're not there. They're not there to see you thanking them. Whereas what's been really great this year is those people were there, and I hope they tuned in for the virtual awards ceremony and. You know, it, it, it's been much more democratic, hasn't it, in a really good way. I'm hoping that, again, next year we can do both. It'd be great. Um, but the thanking you part of it, when you're walking around your little mobile phone, you know, and people are talking. And oh, the other thing is the great range of accents, isn't it? You're hearing so many different <laughs> accents in those films. It's wonderful. There's no kind of proper way of speaking. It's lovely to be so informal, I think. It's just magnificent this year. So uh, we're I running... Uh, I was going to say, add in there, David, and I know perhaps, you know, while, while we're live on this webinar, but yeah. IWF, let's think about streaming the awards live live next year, as well as having a ceremony. I'll go on with you now. Uh, <laughs> we're spending been... everybody else's money here, aren't we, in a really good way, that's fine. So, uh, shall we, we better move on um, before um, they cut you off, actually, Vic, I think. Um, to... <laughs> 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 let's move on to the, uh, the next one, which is on the COVID front line, and that was won by uh, NHS Property Services and again this was an amazingly difficult category to to judge. I was pleased when we looked at them that this was going to a public vote because it would just be really hard to choose between them so let's see their film. I should say it is quiet intention to start and the music comes on soon. I am proud to work for the NHS because you can see the little differences what everybody is making to help get us through this pandemic. It is scary at times but you've just got to run with it. You're protecting others, we've all got to do a bit. We're all a team so we all work together no matter what your job role is. I'm proud to work for the NHS because we just all work together to help the doctors and nurses by making sure that it was all clean. I was scared and scared that if I got it I'd take it all. I just did my job, what I was supposed to do. I'm proud to work for the NHS because they look after people, make sure people are safe and get them well. I'm proud to work for the NHS because my staff, who were so scared at first to go on to the Covid patient places, just got on with it and did everything and property services has been brilliant. I'm proud to work for the NHS because we've had all this PPE equipment. We've never wanted for anything that's all has been there for us. We have had a good team and we've all worked together and it's been amazing. When people were clapping, I just felt like emotional. It was a lovely feeling and I've worked towards that and done my bit. I'm proud to work for the NHS 
Ross, during this pandemic, we've been the support throughout the country to ensure that less people get affected. I'm proud that we've come through all this. I'm proud to work with the NHS. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think um, the pandemic and the way it's been handled and, and the way FM uh, responded, do you think that's maybe changed the way people perceive FM? Who wants to answer that one? Um, uh, yeah, quick. I, I think it has. I think I think um, we've seen that FM is recognised as an essential service now. I don't know if you noticed, you know, when, when this pandemic was going, you know, everyone was coming out and clapping for NHS and it wasn't too long before they said, but actually, what about the cleaners, the security guards, uh, you know, all of that. So I, I think it gave good recognition. I think that recognition we can actually drive and continue to keep on driving our industry because of that. So, yeah, I, I, I think the pandemic has given our our industry a big boost yeah. in, a, in, a, in a weird way, if that makes sense. You know, it's not a great thing, but actually it has put us to the fore again. I think it's I think it's just also highlighted how vast this industry is because I don't know there's still people that still don't understand what is FM we we say it and you know that's not a conversation for today but actually when like you say the cleaners people have actually realized that you know it's vital services that if things don't get done cleaning not done for one day will disrupt a whole building and I really think it's brought to the forefront that FM is such a wide industry but such an important and integral part of every industry. So what do you may think, I, so John, oh, sorry, go on. No, just may I just add, it has actually put the spotlight on each and every person who's been involved in, particularly the NHS, but everywhere, because infection control is absolutely important, but every person involved has been brave they've actually got on with it with the PPE and doing the things that they have to do and we have to thank each and every cleaner by name every day not just on whatever it was the day in the year that we do it we have to thank every porter every electrician everybody in FM they are human beings and they're doing so much for humanity I, I think Joan is a really interesting point there because you know a lot of us have worked from home but they haven't they've had to go in and keep buildings running because actually the infrastructure in the building needs to run so we can work from home and yeah. people don't see that you know I, I, I was speaking to my team in America at one stage and you know in the middle of New York when they were, they were going through their worst periods our, our teams were getting on public transport getting themselves into the office you know trying to stay safe but they had to do that to keep the clients premises going and people forget that and for me, they're like unsung heroes. Every single one of them. Yeah. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. I think the, the fear was the word that came through from just watching that one again, actually. You kind of forget um, because we're, we're still in a pandemic. We're in a different place at the moment, obviously. But you, you tend to forget that, you know, a few of them, they're referenced, you know, we were scared, but we still did it. And there's this sense of, um, without wanting to over aggrandize facilities management or, uh, or the sector more widely there was that it was almost a feeling of a kind of fourth fifth emergency service going in there you know running towards the problems um, rather than running away from them, running towards the fear and and again I, I think what's beautiful from this year is these are normal people these aren't people who are highly trained for combat situations or you know none of us knew what was happening back in March April uh, we didn't know how dangerous it was we didn't know how it impacted on us and they're people going to do normal normal daily you know just their work what they regarded we just did what we were told we did our work and they were very proud of it there were a couple of people there um on on other videos who just said i wanted to go in and do this you know it it really was i think of its time so i'm wondering really what we as a um what we as you know us here on this panel but us more widely can do to try and capitalize on this moment because fm deserves to be more than just something that happened for six months during the pandemic anybody got any views on that uh, oh yeah go Vic. sorry i keep muting myself because i'm the one giving feedback um <laughs> but I, I i just think we like you say we need to take what we have done now and make sure that we don't just talk 
silo in FM about this. We need to talk about the world. We love being the secret army. We love being in the Ladybird book, the elves and the shoemaker. We love being the people. We just get on with it because we're givers. But we now need to talk widely to other industries, to everyone else out there about actually we are the backbone of industry. I quite agree, else? and I, I, I just hope the journalists will remember us and remember what FM has done to actually support the, the nation and probably the world, actually, just, you know, right across the world and, and throughout this pandemic. But why does it take a pandemic to do this? But let's capitalise on it. I, I, I agree. I, I think we've got to do more of this, actually, actually talking about the positives, because if we don't let people know it's the world's best kept secret, and no one knows what we do. And I think by doing more of this, people will go, actually, I want to know more about that industry. I want to get involved in that industry. You know, it, uh, Vicky's right. The industry is not limited by a little silo like that. The industry is as wide as you wanted to make it. And and actually, you know, if you look at all of this panel, we've all come from different backgrounds, from different, and we're all loosely connected in this industry doing different yeah. things. But it is a big industry. And so I, I actually think we've got to keep on talking about it and keep on raising the awareness and talk about the positives. We always talk about the negatives of why things, you know, you, you know, in a building, you'll always know about what something that's gone wrong, which is probably 1% of the time compared to the 99 things that have gone right. And I think yeah. we've got to start talking about the positives. And part of that, I think, comes from it's the diversity and inclusion side of things, because I was challenged, you know, um, about three, four, five months ago, um, be, be, just from, um, from some of the work that we were doing in learning development, you're looking at, are we, one of the lessons from L&D during the pandemic, you know, a lot of people were furloughed, but are we doing enough as a learning development provider to support the, the diversity agenda, the inclusion agenda, for example, is one of those things. Is, are we actually, didn't, we, we don't, we're not teachers as such, you know, we're a learning provider, but are we, are we fostering the right kinds of um, information and knowledge and, and nurturing and supporting? And, and I, we're not, you know, and I found it quite difficult the last three, four months. I mean, like all of us, we all, I do other voluntary stuff as well to try and engage more. And um, I feel I've personally been too silent on that. When you look at those, when you look at those films again, I, I know I talked about accents, but when you just look at the different range of people, and it's a very diverse industry and a really strong, broad backbone to facilities management. And I think there's a challenge for us there, those of us who've been established in the industry longer also, to be doing more on the diversity side of stuff. Um, I, I think, David, yeah. actually, we, we are, as an industry, we are diverse and inclusive because it just what it is. But I think you're right. I don't think we actually recognize that and, and actually use that as a positive in our industry. Yeah. You know, there are other, other industries which are trying to be diverse and inclusive, whereas we're already there. It's, it's standard. Yeah. But what we're not doing is actually how do you capitalize on that? How do you take those ideas from the diverse and inclusive industry to actually keep on driving our industry? Yeah. Yeah. So, for, I mean, that's the personal challenge for me just going forward in the next six months. And, and you know, that was kind of motivated by watching those as well. So um, we've got one more to, to watch. Which, um, which one's this? It's the Adapting to New Realities. This was one by the University of Greenwich. Garden, uh, Gardner and Theobald and Sodexo and um, this demonstrated excellence in managing and maintaining key relationships and commitments and uh, if I remember rightly these guys actually uh, had a big contract change about, <laughs> about a month before Covid hit so very impressive winner. Let's have a look at their video. I came on board in February to do the mobilisation of the IFM full contract. We had a meeting um, in this very building on Thursday and by Monday we were in full lockdown. The, the speed at which things happened, the, the lockdown really over the course of a few weeks we went from doing a normal mobilisation to suddenly not being on site at all. The nature of facilities management is you, you need to be in the buildings looking at, at the plant. We had no idea that we would be moving to a virtual campus in March. So at the time, if I'm honest, I thought maybe it wouldn't happen, but the teams on um, both sides just got together and managed to actually mobilise the contract on time, which really shows this amazing strength of partnership they've already developed. 
It was just really the unknown. I mean, it's never happened to anyone before, so everything that we're doing at the moment, we're learning as we go. Despite the fact that there were contractual challenges to overcome, nobody ever suggested that this wasn't the right thing to do. It's been a strong and collaborative partnership right the way through. Recruiting candidates is tough in a pandemic. People don't want to change jobs because there's so much uncertainty and we've been actually really fortunate and we've managed to recruit the whole team that we needed for this. So I actually didn't meet face to face with my line manager until um, two weeks after I commenced on the contract. The focus on health and safety makes me especially proud. The fact that the team have already overtaken 4,000 risk assessments and have completed over 100 hours of online training in health and safety is really something to be proud of. They give us lots of information, we've done lots of training, so the mobilization team they help us a lot. Transferring all of those staff and their contracts, nobody really knew there was a change, so I think covering that change up was the biggest achievement of all. We were really, really keen that we could enhance our offering to our students and also we saw it as an opportunity to really improve the employment contracts for our staff. We've managed to give people uh, pay rises to get them to London living wage. Um, we've managed to promote some people from within the existing team, which is always a positive. My team, I can't speak highly enough about them. They're really hard-working, team-orientated people. It's positive that, you know, the debts have come in. There is a lot better structure in place. It's about empowering the students and the staff and getting everyone uh, on the same page so we're all one big team, one big community. The campus is amazing. I'm proud to do an apprenticeship with Sodexo. The, the, the life of those people around me, especially during this lockdown, I, I, I really cherish clean work. We want to drive improvement and change, obviously, but in conjunction always with the university. We'll all be able to work together to really offer to staff, to students and the local community some added value that we just couldn't do without this. So that talks about added value despite everything and in those circumstances. Anybody want to comment on that one? I think it just shows how mature our service providers are, that they can actually get all that together and work together with all their people. So it was, you know, all the parties to the, um, oh, thank goodness it's on the slide still, it's a university, it's um, Sodexo, the university, oh, sorry, Gardner and Theobald, and everybody else that was involved, that they can focus on a single agenda and get it done. Just amazing. We forget oh, FM, FM is magic. FM is magic. I'd just like to add in the fact that yet again in this video the word partnership is just so crucial and it was said several times there and it's been said on several times in these awards so that to me is, is just it's just really special when people recognize the partners. I, I think Vic in most awards you know the winners usually have a good partnership there's a that whole relationship is there, whether it be with other organisations or within their own organisation. It's all about working together. And going back to Joanna's analogy of rowing on the boat, you know, not rowing on the boat, sailing on the boat and the clippers, everyone got their own own role to do and everyone doing that role is so critical. Yeah. And Fantastic. that was an example, you heard them talking there about um, promotion, it was about um, enhancements, improvements, promoting people again I would say that wasn't just somebody reacting to how can we how can we stop a negative happening this was somebody saying um, what can we gain from this you know what skills do we have to hand that we can put to other purposes you know so I mean, the students taking advantage of the packing service um, people who've been promoted during this time the classic I guess we've all probably endured the taking somebody on who you haven't met which, uh, although if you if you used to working entirely remotely and have an entirely remote function, that might may well be commonplace. But I would think for most employers, taking or interviewing people, taking them on and inducting them without being able to meet them very soon is unusual. And again, that was a really good example of how they came, how they overcame that thing. Um, so fantastic, right? We're getting close to um, the last few minutes now, so I wonder if I can. Um, this bit's easy for me actually because Julie's going to do this to me and I was going to be one of you but now I can just do it to you so if you had a, if you had a minute to, um, to to persuade someone from our profession who may have maybe sort of doubted 
their capacity to have a wider impact on their team or on their organization, what would you give? Um, what advice would you give to that person? I'm going to start with you, Joanna, if that's OK. I, well, the trouble is I'm so passionate about what we do um, and what we the outcomes. And it's about influencing and actually being part of that outcome to make a difference to the business or the community or the organisation that we're involved in. And it's a direct influence, direct activity, you know, hands on. It's brilliant. It's magical. OK, uh, Ross. I think if people have watched these videos and still don't think that, you know, they need to be persuaded, then they're in the wrong industry. Because these videos and, and the discussion we've just had, then actually just go and find another industry because actually, you know, I wouldn't waste my time. Do you get what I mean? Th these videos and, and what we've been talking about show you the passion in our industry, show the good in our industry, show what we do. And if that doesn't persuade you, then you're going to be really tough to persuade. So go and get another job. <laughs> Sorry for being arrogant, but do, do you get what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> is that? Fair enough. Yeah, it, yeah. No, it's fair enough. I, 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 I agree. I mean, it, I guess the, the, the issue for, for, for IWFM for us more widely is to make is to get people to see these videos, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's about yeah. making people yeah. aware. I've spent this morning um, on some other things um, where I've just been reading. I mean, there must be eight different people, and we're all used to this, but I did I. I didn't know about FM until I moved to the UK, or I'd never heard of the industry. And there's nothing new that I'm saying. We've been saying this for 25 years, I've been saying it. Um, but I think if you can get people past that divide, then you're right, Ross, you can get people into that. We love it, we, we love it. it. I think the challenge for us is to get people past that divide, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, as Vic said earlier, you know, the industry is so wide, so people don't know they're in FM, but they are in FM. FM is just a big title, really. Yeah. So, so and, and, and yeah, we are the backbone of all industries around the world, and people just don't realise that. We are the backbone. If it wasn't for, for, for what we do, no industry would be able to survive. Yeah, okay, no, agree. Um, Vic, I was, your I was, turn. I was going to say, well, yeah. <laughs> I think the one thing I say to anybody in this industry, and whilst I might not be hands-on FM anymore, um, I never knew. I never knew I was in FM. I never knew that running a building was called facilities management. Um, but everything we do impacts on everyone we meet. And I, you, it's it's saying to people. And I think David, you said it at the beginning when we talk about awards. It's just like. And, and even Ross picked it up there. Yes, I go in for awards. It's not about so much. It's about knowing that actually I am good enough, but it's also saying thank you to people that I work with because we're the glue. But like glue, we just kind of mold in, yeah, and become the organization that we work in. You know, I never go, I don't go and work with a client as a client provider. I go in and become the client because that's the how that, that's what FM does. FM goes into the organization and just becomes one with them. We don't stand there going, no, but I'm facilities management. We are your we are your one. We are the secret army, the like you say, backbone of industry. So but I, I think that's a, that's a challenge that I take again for us and for, for IWFM, which I know everyone takes very seriously, is how to how to remove that reference, you know, that secret, that word secret, and that, you know, the best profession nobody knows about, all of those kinds of things. So it's it's another challenge for us, isn't it? That we need to meet head on, it's important. Um, good, okay, so um, <clears throat> looking at the awards next year, final question on the awards before we close then is, um, we don't know necessarily, again, not this is not me for, to, to be talking, it's not my role to be talking about the awards next year, but let's take some liberties and say, how would we ideally like to, to see things? What would we take from this year that we'd want to see transferred to next year if we could? Anyone want to go on that one? The, the one thing, like I say, that stuck out for me was um, the rawness of some of the videos. I want to hear from the frontline workers. Yeah, it's, it's great as a judge to see really slick presentations and I want to make sure that you've answered all the questions, but I want to hear from the people delivering the services because that's what brings any entry to life and it's also it just shows that we are diverse and include like Ross said earlier you know we are very diverse and inclusive we just you know we don't shout about it as much because we it's we've been doing it for years so I want to hear and I want to see the people delivering and hear from those frontliners 
I, I would I would just say it's a passion, the passion on the ground. So you know, a lot of these judges, it's almost like when you sit in a in a it's like a tick box, you know. I'm I'm professional. I've got my suit on. I, I'm I'm going lip service. I've rehearsed it. Whereas actually, what we saw this year is the people on the ground showing the passion and and what they're doing. So I I agree with you, Vic. I, absolutely, that's the best thing to see. It's going back to that analogy of getting man on the moon. You know, when they ask the cleaner, "What are you doing?" I'm getting man on the moon. You know, and that's what we saw. Mm. For me, we have to always remember that not every brilliant organisation or group enters. We've got to encourage everybody that these awards are open to them. And the same applies to the, the ordinary awards, and no, forgive me, they're not ordinary, the impact awards, as yes. well as the special COVID ones. We've got to say to people, this is the way that you highlight best in class. This is how you highlight your staff, your business, your ingenuity and share it with the industry. So your people get recognized, your business get recognized, your business gets recognized, but also you're raising the, the, the game in the whole of the FM industry. This is about extending superlative activity. Just do it, please, please. <laughs> and, I, and I would add to that the, the point that we all that we've all talked about about um, rewarding staff, you know, rewarding the people that work for you, rewarding your team. Um, that's a reason to enter a reason where you don't have to be brilliant in terms of um, technical competence to put in an entry. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's become a, a really good motivation, I think, to do it. I would, I, you know, of course, we want to see as many people enter next year as possible. And um, uh, my, my biggest takeaway would please don't think you can't. You know, th th these are these awards are for us all to enter, you know, for everyone to enter. They're not for other people, for magic people who are brilliant somewhere else. And you know, they're for everybody. The unvarnished part of this year's experience is something I really hope we can we can encourage people and take forward to next year. So, well, thank you, guys. You've made my life incredibly easy. Uh, well, uh, as I say, I, I um. I was going to be on your side of the table, so I really appreciate the help and support uh, today. I've got a couple of things uh, that I just need to do. Um, if we do have any questions, then um, pop them into the box. So I think we're running a little bit short on time, um, that said. Um, before we go, I just need to remind you there's a whole host of content on the uh, IWFM um, Insight Hub, and there's um, a link to that there on the slide in front of you. Um, and also there is the IWFM coronavirus um, pages at the moment that have got uh, links there from IWFM resources related to the pandemic. Um, we always want to know what you are uh, thinking and what's happening where you are. So please do get in touch uh, with questions, case studies, best practice ideas. Send those please to policy at IWFM.org.uk. And uh, as I say, thank you very much, guys, on the panel. Um, we should all, I think, um, Joanna mentioned it at the beginning, extend special thanks to Julie. I'm not sure if you are watching at the moment, Julie, if you are. Hi, we miss you. Um, Julie was a driving force behind the cr uh, creation of this COVID uh, response award. Yes. Uh, it may seem simple to just tack on this extra award, but to have inspired and managed the process through uh, so professionally, such as short time scale and to attract as many entries as it did. Yeah. I think that's deserving of award in itself. So well done, Julie, and thank you, great work. You can read more about all of the 15 winners in the, uh, the case studies from the 15 winners in November's edition of the award-winning Facilitate magazine, which is out this week and free to members. And of course, uh, look out our website and on social media for details of the 2021 awards early next year. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.